please rise for the pledge. Thank you, uh, Mr. Barone. Uh, perhaps if Ashley and Principal Craig could join me on the stage. School Study Council. Uh, this council, which supports education, uh, covers the six surrounding counties uh, in our area. Each year, in the fall, and then once again in the spring, they have their awards for excellence. Their fall awards we have given out, and I believe I might even see some former award winners even sitting here tonight, but I won't call them out. The spring, though, is different. Each school district in the six-county area can name just one teacher, one teacher, for their award for excellence. In meeting with the principals and Mrs. Dudley Demick to discuss this award, certainly a number of names came up district-wide. Ultimately, though, we could only give it to one person. It became pretty apparent, though, that that one person who really deserved this year's award for excellence is, in fact, Ashley Hopper. It is certainly unfortunate that usually we would be at a big dinner with all, with all the gala and the celebration and the hoopla. But unfortunately, obviously, for obvious reasons, we can't do that. But certainly, in no way does that take away from the incredible accomplishments and the dedication of Ashley to her students, to the families, and to the district. Now, here to say a few words about Ashley is her principal, Joel Freer. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I am very pleased to be here to recognize Ashley Hopper, one of my first grade teachers. Ashley is a highly effective member of the Highland Elementary School faculty. She goes above and beyond in all aspects of her work. She takes the time to learn about each and every one of her first grade students as people, and then uses that knowledge to motivate those students to become active participants and learners in her class. Mrs. Hopper has served as the first grade grade level coordinator for the past number of years, where she has been a liaison between her colleagues and the elementary school administration. In her role, she articulates the needs of her grade level and helps to move the district vision and mission forward in her interactions with her colleagues. Mrs. Hopper is a teacher who goes the extra mile, as Mr. Bon Jovi said. This year, she served as one of our remote-only teachers. As we all know, the challenge of motivating students through an online platform was paramount to helping them grow socially and academically. 
She spent countless hours beyond the traditional school day, which is not unlike Ashley Hopper, if you know her. She spends countless hours every year beyond the traditional school day. But this year, most importantly, to make sure that her students were learning at the same pace as their in-person counterparts. And as an example, Mrs. Hopper had a remote first grade student come to her at the beginning of the school year at a pre-primer reading level, basically before kindergarten reading level. Her influence and dedication to meeting the child at their level helped the child grow the equivalent of a year and a half, bringing that child within range to hit grade level reading expectations very soon. It is with my great pleasure that I congratulate Mrs. Hopper for a job well done. She is truly deserving of this recognition tonight. Thank you, Joel, from the bottom of my heart. Your kind words are incredibly touching. I am truly honored and humbled to receive this award. I tend to shy away from any type of recognition because I feel like I am surrounded by others who consistently lift me up and support me to such a high degree and on so many levels. I know that without them, I could not do what I do successfully. As you all know, in a school community, it takes a village to raise a child or children, and I think we are all connected in a very special way because the success of one person depends on so many. Of course, this primarily applies to our children, but it certainly applies to the success of us teachers as well. Therefore, I would just like to take a moment to elevate a few groups of people who truly deserve to be recognized, especially over this past year, which has brought monumental hurdles. I first thank my students and their families because despite being in an all remote class all year long, they show up every single day with the brightest smiles and with energy, excitement, enthusiasm, and joy. I feel so, so lucky to be their teacher and I do not take one day for granted. The parents have been working overtime to support me in every possible way to ultimately help their children be successful, and I could not do it without their unending support. Thank you to Joel and Matt for lifting us all up, for supporting us, and for being responsive to every single need, whether it's through an email, or a phone call, or a text. They work around the clock and on weekends, just like us teachers. Just to give an example, I remember emailing Matt recently on a Saturday night at 8.21 p.m. about the Reflex Math program. Sorry about that, Matt. I checked the timestamp to be sure. Literally 10 minutes later, he got back to me. 10 minutes. Um, Joel has responded instantly during off hours on numerous occasions also. Thank you both for your leadership and for handling so many issues and hurdles with absolute grace during this pandemic. And then, of course, there are the teachers. I have to tell you that every single teacher I know, and I'm not exaggerating, has been bending over backwards and going above and beyond to meet and exceed the needs of every single student. In my opinion, they all deserve this award, hands down. Last, but certainly not least, 
Thank you to the Board of Education. We teachers are incredibly appreciative of your time, your dedication, and your attentiveness to every area of school and community life. We feel the love and support, and we are thankful for your steady leadership and direction. The same applies to Superintendent Bon Jovi and Assistant Superintendent Dudley Lemmick. Thank you. Sometimes I take a step back and marvel at the level of synergy and connectedness we have as a school community and as a district. That connectedness is especially magnified in the wake of COVID. Even though it has been tested and stretched and tried and worked, it is an everlasting and unshakable bond that makes me so proud and thankful to call Highland my home away from home. It is a privilege to be a part of such a strong community that always puts children first, and I am inspired by all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley, for those kind words. An award well deserved. Thank you again. Our next special presentation is targeted school improvement. I believe Sarah. And updating quite a bit throughout the year about the district level work that we're doing for our TSI plan. So this is really a review of information we've already discussed. Um, two big parts of the district level plan were the panoramic climate, sur climate survey, which we administered in February. Uh, we shared those results, I believe, at the last meeting or the meeting before. Um, since that time, we've shared those results with our equity committee, we shared them with, and we're in the midst of sharing them with our building staff. I think a couple of buildings have done it already, but one more left to look at that. I know on the equity committee, we are breaking down that information from the panorama survey um, in response to specific questions from members of the equity committee. And then, of course, we've been working with Dr. Jessica Blanc, um, our consultant. He's been doing staff and student focus groups. We'll hear a little bit more about that in um, updates from the buildings. He's done parent focus groups. We have our district-wide committee that meets monthly with subcommittees meeting at least once a month. Some of the subcommittees, I think, are meeting more than that. They will be doing an update for the Board of Education at our next um, board meeting. 
So you'll have representatives from each of the subcommittees giving you an overview of the work that they've done, as well as the direction that they see moving into um, 2021-22 school year. So that's the work, part of the work at the district level, of course, the district is also supporting the work that's being done at each of the buildings. So I'm going to hand it over to Joel so we can talk a little bit more about the elementary school. Thank you, Sarah. So at the elementary school, as you know, uh, one of the, the targets for us was uh, Black and African American I am going to spend a little bit of time during the math slide showing you some successes from our reflex program. But the, um, the goals that we selected and we presented to the board back in January and February, there were five goals and uh, one was in ELA and math and then others were targeted toward uh, aspects of our school, whether they were survey goals or other academic or social needs that we found in the building. So, if you look at ELA, um, what we've been doing since uh, we first presented our plan back in February, uh, we've reallocated the way we've used some of our teaching assistants, especially once we return to in-person learning. Um, some of the teaching assistants are now able to work with individuals and small groups. We have our BOCES consultant. Uh, she has been meeting with our teachers for a number of years on the Teachers College Reading and now the Writing Program. And she's been able to meet with each grade level a multiple number of times this year. And she's currently in a final round for this school year where we will be talking about next steps for the upcoming school year. And some of the work that she's been working on will be highlighted later in the slide, but are uh, in the presentation, but she uh, quickly um, she created videos that would help teachers, not just in the reading and the writing, but also to be culturally diverse and equitable in the literature that we're choosing. Teachers College came out with a series of online resources, so we made sure that those were in our teachers' hands so that they could use them in the classroom and with our remote-only students. And I'm proud to say that they did an excellent job of fully utilizing those resources it's unclear as to whether or not Teachers College will make those resources available again in the future. That was sort of their response to the COVID situation. So many of the teachers, especially at the fourth and fifth grade level, are trying to recreate some of those videos uh, to use in the future before the videos that uh, are up on the TC site go away. Uh, also, the BOCES consultant met with our teach some of our teaching assistants and offered them some support in ELA so that they can help teachers work in the classroom on the targets uh, that were identified through DIBBLES and, and benchmark assessments. So our DIBBLES end of year assessments, uh, if you remember the chart from February, it was a, a red, yellow, and green chart and it showed growth at the beginning of the year middle of the year, we're not quite at the end of the year yet, so we don't have uh, that data that is actually going to be called out in the next couple of weeks as they do the end of the year assessments. Um, so we'll have, uh, we'll have more information to, to share uh, in comparison to our January targets. I spoke a little bit, um, I've been putting it in my board report for a number of months now, but uh, the pilot of the Reflex math, math program continues, and it's showing great success. And I have a slide, I think one slide beyond this, to show you a little bit more about that. Um, but it is showing us that with consistent use, it is having positive upward trends in our student population. The teachers have been working in grade level groups at the most recent curriculum meetings to analyze the data from our benchmark assessments targeting the skills and the best practices that came from those uh, conversations and implementing them in the classrooms. Teachers have been working, and again, this is sort of a teacher's college, the anchor chart is that resource that goes on the wall. It's a learning tool, but then it's put on the wall so students can uh, rely on it at another time. That's like a teacher's college reading and writing um, element, but we've, move that over into the math element as well so that they are creating those charts and uh, having them available for students on the walls in the classroom. So most of our classrooms have those now. Uh, 
and I thank the teachers for all the hard work that they've done this year in getting those up and providing consistency from room to room and grade level to grade level. And then we've had pre preliminary meetings to start discussing the idea of replacing the benchmark assessments, which are locally created with a star math online assessment. So it will give us some data that not only we can compare ourselves longitudinally over the course of a year and see growth from September to January to June, but it's also uh, it's normed across the country, so it will give us uh, ideas on how our students are faring uh, with other entities. So this, this I don't know where that came from. <laughs> so this is um, this is one of the slides that I wanted to spend a little bit of time on. We use the Reflex program. We've been using it since the end of March, just before the spring break. Remember, we were all remote in those classes except for kindergarten before spring break. So this shows that with consistent use of the program, our trend line is going up, and it's going up pretty rapidly. So I disaggregated this data with the help of Mr. Darling for the subgroup that we've been targeted uh, under the New York State plan for our black and African American subgroup. In grades two through five, there are 22 students that fall into that subgroup. So that's on the bottom of the slide, you'll see the number 22. They have gained the fluency in facts at the rate of 1,563 facts since the beginning of this pilot program. That's a, an average of 71 facts per student. We know that when students learn their facts with automaticity, their math skills go up. So we're hoping to see this translate into problem solving and uh, other aspects of math. So this subgroup, if you take a look at this, 20 students have used it regularly. That's that number on the far, far right. And we are, uh, in the, the course of the time that the program has been going, on average, students have used the program 13.4 days. And then there's a green light usage, which you'll see in the next slide. But what that tells us is the students that are using it, 55.3% of them are on the program for between 15 and 20 minutes or longer. And not just having the screen on, but interacting with the interface. If the child just logs on and does nothing, they don't get a green light. If the child logs on, is only on for a few minutes and goes off, the green light doesn't come on. So it shows that children are not using it uh, regularly. That number is starting to rise as children are seeing what they're going to see on the next slide, but not yet, Sarah Fuhrman. Um, so how are we using this data? We're using it to have conversations with teachers and families. We know that with increased student usage, their facts are going up. We see, ide uh, we're identifying areas of achievement and growth. And it's also helping to inform small group instruction and interventions in the classroom, but also within our AIS math classes. The next slide is really, this one's the telling slide. So this is, how do we take the information that we're getting from the Reflex program, and how do we have conversations that are meaningful? So we target the conversations. That first slide is a slide that can go home to parents, but it also can be used in the classroom with a student. Those darker green circles that are completely filled in, that means the child is fluent in using that fact family. If it's lighter green, that means they're not fluent yet, and if it's half and half, it means that they're almost there, they're working on it. They may have, I believe this is a, might be a third grader. This is multiplication and division, so has the multiplication down, but not necessarily the inverse property complete at this point. So this is an example of one particular student's uh, family report or a report that a teacher can use with uh, the child. If you look on the right hand side, this child has used the program for 18 days, has used it 2.6 days per week, has gained 103 facts. A little over to the right of that, you'll notice this child started out with two facts known from that initial assessment. 
Because of the amount of time this child has spent on the program, he or she has gained 45.5% or 103 facts, bringing that child up to 105 facts. This child has worked consistently at 66.7%, getting that green light, meaning every time he or she logs on, they're on for 15 to 20 minutes and practicing the work that we're asking them to do. The next one's very interesting and on the bottom, because in the last seven days, and this was a week ago when we printed this, but in the last seven days, the child has used the program for four days, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. Didn't use it on the weekend, didn't use it on Wednesday. Gained seven facts last week with automaticity. So the interesting thing is, this sheet, when, we, when you print it, it has the child's name on the top. But we can clip this so that it does not indicate who the child is. And if we wanted to show another parent who maybe the child is not growing as fast, we could say here's another child who is spending more time or less, we wouldn't necessarily say less time, but obviously with a child who's spending more time and having greater gains, we could have that conversation with the parent and encourage them to encourage their child to possibly use the program on Saturday, Sunday, that Wednesday remote day, or even in the evenings. So I think there's a lot of information that comes just from these two pieces of information from the Reflex program. We're very excited that we're starting to have those conversations, not just with the students, but with the families. And then we can go on to the next piece. So other things that we're doing at the elementary school, the grade levels have determined titles that should be purchased to increase our cultural diversity of books in our classrooms. This has been an ongoing thing in our school for a number of years now. Um, Mr. Darling got the, together the, those titles this morning, and we have a purchase order ready for the business office that will get uh, ordered this week. So thank you, Mr. Darling, for that work. Our, as I mentioned earlier, our OCS content specialist because it was difficult, and also we did not want to take our teachers out of classrooms as often, we used our BOCES content specialist to help create videos for teachers to inform instructional practices around cultural diversity. So instead of taking teachers out to attend professional development, when we only had them in for a couple of days a week with the different cohorts, we utilized our consultant in a different way. And I think that will pay off for us in the long run and uh, we utilize those services just in a different way. Uh, as an administration team, we are working, we are starting the process, and this is actually one of our summer goals, but we have already started an outline of a workshop that we will have ready to prepare or to present to our cafeteria recess aides around social emotional learning so that when we get our students back to full force and out uh, utilizing uh, the, the recess time uh, under their tutelage, it will be um, overseen with greater uh, emphasis on the social emotional learning component. Teachers are getting these workshops on a regular basis and we felt it was important that our cafeteria recess aides got that as well. Absenteeism, this was our, our last and final goal. We always want to be working on absenteeism, so that was the last goal of our TSI plan. And uh, we are addressing that daily, as mentioned in the plan. We've included psychologists and social workers through outreach uh, by teachers and our attendance office and administration making phone calls. And uh, that is something that we will continue to do, and I know the other schools are doing that as well. Our attendance has, has been pretty, pretty consistently high, um, but we never want to see that slip. And I think during COVID year, um, there have been times when maybe we have not had full participation on those remote days. Um, and so that's when we, we felt it was important that we couldn't let that just sit idle. We had to address that. So we've been addressing that on a daily, weekly, and monthly basis with parents and students. And I believe the next slide is Mrs. Coburn at the middle school.
So it's okay. grades two through five. Uh, it has not been rolled out in every grade in every class at this point. It's, uh, you know, we are at the piloting stage, but we, our expectation with what we're seeing right now is that it will be rolled out to everyone in the fall. Okay, yeah, this, this looks great. Uh, are, are the children using this at home or school or both? It's a combination of both, but uh, mostly within uh, school during centers. But it is available to students who use at home. That's as I mentioned in the slide. It tells you if the child has used it on a Saturday or a Sunday, mm -hmm. and they'll get that green light if they've done 15 to 20 minutes, just like they would get if they used it in the classroom. Could you give me an example of a fact? Is it just like one problem? Is that defined well, as if, a fact? Well, if you looked at that green triangle, yeah. you'll see all the different facts that that child is working on. So it's the multiplication facts and also the inverse, which is the division facts. Okay. Okay. And uh, the last, can the child take this as far as they want to go? Like if they want to, if they find this a lot of fun, can they just continue working on this? Well, I think once they've mastered and gotten their facts, then we will be looking for other things to take them to that next level. This is fact fluency because this is one of the identified areas where we felt children didn't have their facts with automaticity so that they could be successful in those other, in those other uh, whether they're online programs or they're just you know, classroom-based programs. If you don't have that automaticity with your facts, it holds you back. Thanks. It's actually quite exciting because yeah. when I taught third and fifth grade, I know I spent months trying to get kids to remember their facts. So this, it shows that, you know, it's, it's self-fulfilling almost. As I mentioned the last time you talked about the Reflex program, I mean, it continues with my daughter. You know, one of the feedback that we received from her teacher, not just on my daughter specifically, but just in general in third grade when they're using learning multiplication and division, the time in school not having that repetitiveness was one thing that he was missing. And I can say that my daughter's been using it because it does give you incentives if you get the green light, I assume it's called, she just calls it, there's a circle that shows that once you complete the circle is what right. she calls it. Yep. But once you do it five days in a row, you get to unlock a new game. Correct. And that's like so exciting for them. Like she was upset the one day in class because they only gave her 10 minutes. It really took her 15 to get that full right. circle. Well, and the other nice... So she went home and did it because. Right. <laughs> that's awesome. And the other nice thing is that uh, this is something different than what they've used in the past. So yes, we can still utilize some of those other uh, online programs, but whenever you can change something up, you reinvigorate and re-motivate. So I think that's important. And I'll say it's, it's games, but from the other stuff that I've used with her, like over the summers and stuff, it's more game-ish. This is definitely high fluency. It shoots those problems right at you. So it definitely does keep them going better than a lot of the other Games that I've right, seen. and then the other thing that I would say is that not only is it students recalling those facts, but it's also what what is the speed at which they're doing it? Because we know that when it becomes second nature, you know, you say the facts out loud, and I hope that all of us in this room would know our facts from you know the multiplication facts through a hundred, like that. That's where we want to get our students so that they can move on to higher level thinking and. Right. and critical thinking. And I would even say comparatively to the app that they were using right before this one, it was trying to get them to do it quickly, yeah. but in a way that was actually discouraging her. Like it would eh, and give her a timer where it would make her nervous, where sure. this one doesn't do this, and it, it really just motivates more so than anything, I think. So great job on the Well, nothing's that better than to have uh, parent feedback like that, so we definitely appreciate that, and uh, we can show your child's report if you'd like to see it. <laughs> I will be getting it. There you go. <laughs> no, but it's good that it has that reporting capability. Yeah. I didn't know that side of it, but it right. is good. Yeah, just, uh, I love the, the data that you shared. And just curious, how does this compare to uh, the parents? We have black and African American, but just what is it like uh, look at all the students that are taking it as far as the 
Well, I specifically did that slide. Um, if the very first slide we'll, um, we did for all of the grade levels, and it shows an, uh, uh, across the board uh, an increase in uh, students moving forward. Um, but specifically because of the TSI status for that particular subgroup, I felt it was important that I highlight that children are moving forward in that subgroup. So I think it's, it's, it's similar, um, but there are also two students on that very first slide I don't have it in front of me, but if you go back to that slide, there are two students that are not using it consistently. So what does that do? That brings the question of the teacher having conversations with the student, with the family, and showing them the importance of using the program. So um, the data will be more sound in the, in the fall because we'll have all the demographics loaded for the entire school once it's not a pilot. Because it was a pilot program, all that's in there right now is the student's name. Um, the black and African American subgroup was something that Mr. Darling and I, um, we went in and we hand selected that just so that we could get this piece together to show that it is important for that particular subgroup uh, moving forward. And it's my, my other question, going back to the Wilsey's videos. Yes. Just what are some examples of the practices that you've seen adopted in the classroom based on the Wilsey's videos that teachers are watching? Well, they're just being rolled out to the teachers now. So um, I don't know if there's any one particular thing that I can point to at this point, but um, I know literature was one of the, um, the elements that the BOCES consultant was re reviewing with the teachers and showing them how to uh, ask questions that um, were not, um, I'm trying to pick my words here. Uh, they were sensitive to all students, so, you know, removing, um, yeah, I'm losing, I'm losing my train of thought, but it's the, the videos, and we can share those videos with you so that you can see the work that she's done, um, but I haven't been in classrooms where I've seen anything in particular to point to at this point because they're just being rolled out. So Joel, is it using more inclusive language? It's, I believe it's inclusive language, but I think uh, one of the videos pointed to just the way that we represent, um, you know, historical, historical information, that it's not just from one perspective. So, and that's not, that's not always something that's readily available for teachers, so it's, you have to kind of go out and you have to, and find that, and that's not something that comes in a manual, it's, would it be great if it was, but, uh, you know, especially in social studies, um, you know, we're using materials that are not necessarily, uh, I don't know, racially sensitive, I guess is the, the best word that I can, that I can come up with. Thank you. Well, anyone else? Good evening. So the first slide is an update on our math and ELA star data. So both for math and ELA, our students were tested three times throughout the school year. Once in the beginning of the school year, once in the winter, and the last time ELA was tested last week and math was assessed this week. So the data from the math, three, the three assessments for math will be the focus of our summer curriculum work. We will use this data to outline how we will target, differentiate, support, and modify our curriculum for September in order to meet the needs and challenges of our students as well as address the differing levels of the students' proficiency. I will give you a little bit more detail on the next slide. The ELA STAR data will be used to inform all of our HMS staff about where our students are currently and to help us better shape our practices, curriculum selections, and building level goals moving forward. And I'll give you more information about that when we get to that slide. Since November of 2020, the math department has been working with the math consultant from Ulster BOCES during our monthly curriculum meetings. As a department, the first goal was to establish common vocabulary to be used through grades six through eight. 
Over the past month, we have focused on developing a rubric that will help us identify our key wants and needs in a math program to help support our math curriculum in grades six through eight. With the help of Karen Brooks and her math consultant, we identified 10 potential math programs, and last week, the math department worked together using the rubric to narrow the list down to two programs. The two math programs we are going to look further into are Envision Mathematics and EdGems. The next step is meeting with representatives from both of these companies to decide which one we will pilot this September. For ELA, since students return to four days of in-person instruction, we have reintroduced our very successful Just Read It program, Building Wide. That is one of the handouts that I gave you. Um, it has the days of the week and there's Husky reading on the front of it. This is an example of the posters that are posted around the room or around the school. So each subject area is assigned a day of the week and students spend the first 15 minutes of class reading a book, a magazine, or an article of their choice. Our staff also participate in this quiet reading time. Over the past year and a half, I've had staff approach me numerous times to share how this opportunity to sit quietly and read along with our students has provided a built-in conversation starter and oftentimes an instant connection to some of, um, an instant connection for some of our students about the book, the magazine, and article that we're reading. Our ELA seventh grade team began piloting, piloting a program called IXL to reinforce these specific skills and standards that are being taught in the classroom. This tool offers real-time diagnostics, which pinpoints students' grade level proficiency in key language arts strengths. Our ELA department is also reviewing the representation of multicultural and diverse populations in content and grade level materials. On this next slide would be the second printout I gave you, which is a long sheet. This is the, when a teacher logs into IXL, this is basically their homepage. So on the screen behind me is just a little snapshot of the printout that you were given in, um, in front of you on the, the extra ones that are flimsy in front of you. So IXL allows students to practice skills connected to reading and get instant feedback. Teachers can set targets for mastery, which as you can see on your skills progress, the teacher gets to say how many points skills mastered equals, will equal. The program scales questions as they go. The teacher can see in a live view in real time as students answer questions. The program provides the student's name, the skill they are working on, how many questions they have answered, if a student is idle, and alerts you if a student is struggling. You even have the option to see the exact problem the student is struggling with and send them a direct message at that exact point to help them move through that, that problem. The feedback is quick, it's straightforward, and it dovetails well with the skills the teachers are using in class to build reading fluency and vocabulary decoding. IXL also works as a companion piece to our STAR assessment as it gives a second, gives a second set of data points about students that can, be, that can be used to really pinpoint this area's successes and struggling points. IXL also offers a way to then practice and reinforce those skills in the classroom and at home. So you can also see on the printout, it shows you exactly how much time they're using this in the classroom or at home so we can kind of see where the progress is, and are they struggling more at home, in person, and how many questions they're answering. And our third uh, goal for TSI was an other, so we did a survey and we're focusing it around our climate and culture, our culture and climate within the building. So over the last two months, Dr. LeBlanc has had the opportunity to work with small groups of students throughout the middle school and identify areas where we can work together and target PD opportunities surrounding culture, climate, and student voice. Dr. LeBlanc will be coming in again on the 27th of May to work specifically with different groups of students throughout the day. Our school librarian is also currently working on an audit of all of our books in the middle school library to identify areas in our collection that need attention in order to represent the diversity, equity, and inclusivity of all of our student body. And the last thing is, we are beginning the planning process for a more in-depth orientation process for all of our students this summer. Do you have questions? 
Thank you. Good evening. I am pleased to report the high school student performance. This is a comparison, what you're about to see is a comparison of passing rates from the past three years at the end of the third quarter, which is the middle of April, and passing rates from the end of the school year, which obviously is the end of June. Uh, so in the 2018-2019 school year, at the end of the third quarter, we had a 92% passing rate, and at the end of the school year, we had a 93% passing rate. In the 2019-2020 school year, which was last year, at the end of the third quarter, we had a 91% passing rate, and at the end of the fourth quarter, a 97% passing rate. And this year, in the 2020-2021 school year, at the end of the third quarter, we had an 82% passing rate, and the percent of students who passed within the year is still to be determined. We still have five and a half weeks until that time. And what the next slide will show you is some of the interventions that we're using to change that average. Of course, there are ongoing conversations between building administration and the teachers about encouraging students to submit makeup work that will help improve their grades. Student participation in the credit recovery through the after school bridge program. So uh, just a couple of numbers to point out to you. This was in uh, Karen Brooks's report to you, I believe, this year. So we just finished the fourth week of the bridge program. Week number one, we had 60 high school students, 6-0, six 60 high school students attend. Week two, we had 71 students attend. Week three, we had 54 students attend. And week four, were 44 students. I need to point out that is a fluid program. Often students stop attending once they are passing, which would explain the declining numbers. This is the end of the fifth week. Once progress reports go out, I do anticipate the numbers will go up again once we can identify the students who really need to use the bridge program. Uh, and of course, students do often utilize the office hours to meet with their teachers remotely during office hours each Wednesday. Um, that is reported to me by teachers each and every week that it is used wisely by many students to make up work. Moving forward, we do continue to encourage our students to do their very best at all times, and we remind them often about the interventions and resources available to them. It is my hope, of course, and I do anticipate that that 82% will be a much higher number in five and a half weeks. Uh, anecdotally speaking, I was in a, a principal's meeting last week with all the Ulster County principals, and I just threw this out there asking them about their passing rates, and you probably aren't surprised, it's pretty similar at the end of the third quarter this year. Um, people struggled this year, obviously, but we are doing our best to get those passing rates up, and I anticipate we will be able to. And that's all I have this evening. Any questions? questions? Say that, uh... Having 71 students at the high school level staying after is a lot. Uh, being a former high school principal, you know, high school kids, you know, tend to by when the bell rings if they're not in the sport or you know some other activity, you know, they're out of here. So to have 71 students, you know, staying, that's a lot. And it is, you know, it's not an excuse, but it is understandable. Uh, that the passing rate at the moment is not as high as it's been in the past, but it's also, and again, not a, not a, an excuse, but you know, it's uh, kind of a high school attitude that they you know uh, tend to pour it on at the end, uh, and these numbers are probably inflated, obviously because of the pandemic situation. And and I know that Mr. Zimmer has, been, has had individual conversations with teachers looking specifically at the students who are not passing their particular class and talking about these interventions or if there are um, you know, interventions beyond the academic level that need to be made too. We're, we're certainly utilizing our support um, staff. For example, by also encouraging alternate assessments with teachers instead of the same assessments that they use every year. Traditionally, we're encouraging alternate assessments to get the students to the same place, maybe with a different uh, approach. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
certainly, as you mentioned before, there are only four regents exams that will be administered this year, so that gives us a lot of freedom to look at um, standard attainment in, in a different way than we've done in the past. So it, it does offer um, some flexibility. I'd also like to point out that this year I've called a brought more students down to my office than ever before to have a discussion with them about their grades individually one-on-one -on -one, and to encourage them to stay at the school and making more phone calls home than ever about this. And it seems to be getting pretty good results so far. I'm sorry? Is this about 25 children or students we're talking about? 25, 30? Overall, uh, I can't say right now. I don't know. I know as for seniors, we're talking about four. Um, I'm focusing on them right now. You're, uh, I'm sorry, Sue, so you're talking about... The, for the percentage, the 82 percent? Uh, I'd have to crunch some numbers there, but uh, it might be a little more than that, a few more than that. Um, when I'm talking to a few of the students, and it, maybe this is a surprise, maybe it's not, but in high school, we, we encourage students to take more classes than they need to graduate. Instead of sitting in a couple of study halls a day, we, I, and the guidance counselors encourage them to take classes just for the sake of taking classes. Many of the students, some of them realize that they don't actually need it to graduate. They don't need that credit. So some of the passing rates, if, if they realize that, and they realize, well, I really don't need this class as a credit to graduate, therefore their incentive isn't there. We still encourage them to pass, of course. But uh, I, I do believe that there are some who uh, have realized that. and. Uh, they're relying on the credits that they did earn. So, so what I can do um, is crunch the numbers and I can email you those to tell you exactly how many numbers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And so just so you're aware as well, um, the TSI program continues into next year. So we've already started the process for creating our plan um, for next year. You should have that in well, I don't know if you'll have COVID with July New York meeting, but you definitely will definitely have it in August. Um, that does involve collaboration with, with not only uh, teachers, but also with community members. So we're starting that process now. So we'll, we'll be continuing a lot of the work that we started with this plan will be continuing into next year as well. Can you, so on the, um, for the TSI for this year, we were given some funding for yes. some of that program. Is that the same thing for next year? Yes, and it's a, it's a significant amount of money. You, you um, I'm going to remember though, I think it's $50,000 each school and the district. So it's, it's seventy five. No, it's $150,000 total um, towards this program. Uh, so, you know, again, we'll be able to continue to utilize Dr. LeBlanc. Um, you know, we're looking at the STAR testing, some of the reflex math, some of those kinds of programs will, will have the financial support to continue those. Yeah, I'm really interested at the middle school level, especially hearing about some more of those programs that are used. I know we have a lot of stuff um, planned and a lot of it's focused on professional development. Um, so I like seeing the other side of it as well, focused on you know more time for the students and more resources for them. Well, so thank I'm, you. I, I'm very excited, and um, you know, Megan went kind of quickly through, but the fact that the math department really wants to look at a math program that will be consistent six, seven, eight. You know, if you remember back when I first started in this position, um, we were going into Common Core, and we relied on the Common Core um, modules they called them in math, and that's how we built our math curriculum at that point in time. Uh, I think we're now at the point. First of all, there's the next generation of the Common Core standards that are coming up and the students will be accountable for. Uh, they just pushed them off another year. But um, we've come to the point where that's really not enough. We need to make sure that we have something that's consistent, truly consistent from place, to, you know, from year to year to year. That's a very specific program that can use that common vocabulary that they've created. So um, what was most exciting in the conversation that Megan and I have had is that all of the math teachers are excited as well. So they sat down together, went through every one of those programs using the rubric they had created. And you know they want to look at something that's different. It's not the, the math textbooks that we had when we were in school where you did the chapter and then you 
you know, did a quiz or a test on Friday and moved on to the next one no matter what, you know, whether it was a beta line or something, but I was always a week behind, it felt like. Um, so really looking at some programs that integrate the technology that we're going to have available, um, that allow for students to move a little bit more at their pace, so it's more standard space. Um, so, so again, I'm very excited that they're, they're really working together and communicating and cooperating together to put something, um, to choose a program for the whole mobile school. I think that would be a great development. That would be just like a test. Anything else? Okay. Thank you, Sarah, Megan, Joel, and Bill. Uh, just a quick note. Uh, we will, if we do not complete our agenda, we will take a break uh, about 8.55 to walk next door to, to listen to the results of the budget and the uh, proposition <coughs> votes. Okay, moving on. Be it resolved, the Board of Education, upon a recommendation of the superintendent, acknowledges reviewing and accepting the following reports as presented at this meeting. Treasury report, March 2021 and April 2021 in our extracurricular activity statement, January through March 2021. Can I have a motion, please? Motion by Ed. Second by Sue. Discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? So carry. Uh, principal's monthly report, Joel. Hello again. Is it on? Hello? Yes. So the only update that I have to my report, and I just actually want to acknowledge and recognize uh, Mrs. McLaren for spending two Friday mornings with Mr. Darling and I. Uh, she came down, she took a tour of our entire building. She got to see every nook and cranny, even the long hallway down in the basement in the electrical room. So thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. I know you're acclimated to our district, but thank you. Uh, well, it's our district now. Thank you for uh, spending time with us. And then this past week, she came down and we started talking uh, program and uh, financials. So that was good. Um, I don't have any other things to add to my report unless there are any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Good evening again. Uh, the only update I have is I put a, um, it's not technically your invitation, but a flyer for our eighth grade promotion parade. So it's just a little teaser of what will be coming then. Yep, it's the blue one, it looks like this. Any questions? I know that those events that we had last year were just so popular and so successful. Uh, we felt that uh, and I know many parents have approached me and faculty and staff that the, it was just so much more personal uh, doing the drive-through. <clears throat> it was really enjoyable and really uh, created a, uh, you know, an energy and uh, cohesiveness to the district and each building. So I thought it was fantastic. I look forward to all of them again this year. Our staff are very excited for all the different little activities we have along the way. For ELA, we, in sixth grade, we had 19, and for math, it was 21. For ELA in seventh grade, it was 39, and for math, it was 42. And for eighth grade, ELA, it was 42, and 52 for math. That does not include our all virtual students who are automatically opted out. We had one student in sixth grade for the ELA who chose to come in for the ELA exam, but that was the only time. You're welcome. Thank you. 
I have three additions to the high school principal's report. First, congratulations to the cast and crew of Wonderland High. Uh, it's, it was our Zoom musical that premiered this past weekend. It was a successful and a different, interesting type of musical. Um, fantastic job by all students who participated. And also thank you to musical director Dan Shaw and our the director, Erin Bradley. Fantastic job. Next, we advanced, advanced placement exams began today at 12 noon. They will run until June 10th. We have 138 students, so we're taking a total of 231 AP exams, which is a number that's even more than previous years. So, great job to them. Finally, I have an exciting update on our Citizens in Action class taught by Mrs. Saylor. After the students presented to you last month, uh, the board meeting about their proposal of mental health days, Kathy McCulloch reached out to her friend, Senator Michael Martucci, who set up an in-person meeting with Mrs. Saylor, her students, and one of his representatives to discuss their proposal. Since then, our students have been in touch with Senator Michelle Hinchy's office. They have a Zoom meeting scheduled with Senator Hinchy on Wednesday, June 2nd, to discuss their Mental Health Day legislation idea. Best of luck and congratulations to the Citizens in Action class for the efforts in bringing their proposal to the next level. Kudos to them. And that's all I have. Questions? Thank you, Will. Thank you. Okay, our director's monthly report. Uh, I believe we have all our directors here this evening, so if you have any questions for uh, the director, you can ask him some questions. I just wanted to thank Kathy for reaching out to the senator in regard to the mental health. That, that was great. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? Okay, we'll move on to approval of the Committee on Special Education Minutes. Be resolved, the Board of Education hereby accepts the recommendations of the CPSC and the CSC committees according to the information provided in regard to meetings and classified status of students. Meeting date range, all meetings were held virtually through Zoom virtual meeting platform. Total, April 14th. 2021 through May 11, 2021, all meetings were held virtually through the Zoom virtual meeting platform. Total 100 meetings. Please note, 79 were annual reevaluation meetings for 2021-2022 school year. IEPS and 21 were for program reviews, initials, etc. for the 2020-2021 school year. Can I have a motion, please? Motion by Tom, second by Camille. Discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? So carry. Under personnel, we would like to take personnel from A through F of the block. We can have a motion to take it as a block. Motion by Ed, second by Heather. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? So carried. Yes, Mr. President. <clears throat> First of all, I'd like to thank and congratulate Linda Fonda for her service to Highland as a librarian. She's retiring after 17 years. So we certainly wish her all the best. Uh, we do have, <clears throat> as you know, we've, uh, we're continuing to build and hire people in the transportation department. We're still short people, but thankfully we found two fantastic uh, people to join our team. So if they could just stand up. So Hortensia Reyes, Hortensia is in the back. Uh, Hortensia is a bus attendant. Okay. And then uh, Joe uh, McGarry is here. Joe is a driver. So we want to welcome them to the Highland Transportation Family and the Highland Central School District. Thank you. Yes, thank you to our new hires thank and also congratulations to Linda Fonda for 17 years uh, with the district. Okay, other business and operations, budget transfers. Be it resolved, the Board of Education, upon the recommendation of the superintendent, approves the following budget transfer for the 2020 2021 school year as presented to the board at this meeting. Budget transfer number 
total amount $75,000, and that's to cover our bridge program. Can I have a motion, please? Motion by Camille, second by Ed. Discussion? I want to thank Karen Brooks and all the teachers who participate in that program. Uh, as you hear, have you, have you heard and have been hearing, it's been very successful at, at all levels, uh, and it is uh, you know, money well spent, certainly. We're here for the kids, and that's what it's for. Thank you. Uh, change orders. Be resolved the Board of Education upon our condition of superintendent hereby approves Darlin Associates to change order for the following projects as presented to the board at this meeting. Project at the high school, change order 102013, deduct for unused, unused contingency order, a total amount of $1,000. Another change order for 102014 unused, another deduct for unused contingency order, amount $38.25. Can I have a motion, please? Motion by Ann, check by Heather. Discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? So carried. Our bid award for the central office, be resolved the Board of Education. Upon Board of Education of the Highland Central School School District upon the recommendation of the superintendent with respect to the 2018 capital improvement project. High School North Entry Renovations, the general construction contract number 2-01 award the project to the parent low bidder, Iron Sword Enterprises LLC, in the amount of $54,300, which is the base bid. Can I have a motion, please? Motion by Heather, second by Tom. Discussion? I believe this is a long anticipated uh, awarding of this contract to have yes. that canopy uh, approved for the main entrance to the central office. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? So carry. Right along. Uh, assistant superintendent comments. Sarah. Good evening again. I'll go fairly quick. I want to echo Mr. Zimmer and give a huge uh, congratulations to our theater department and our students who participated in Wonderland High. That was pretty phenomenal. Uh, you know, I think it's a great example of the flexibility, creativity, ingenuity um, that not only students but teachers have shown throughout COVID. Uh, it was really phenomenal uh, performance. I also want to give a shout out to our uh, K-12 art department who put together a virtual art show. I don't know, I sent the link to everyone. Um, it's pretty pretty cool interface. You, you actually walk through the galleries looking at the students art or um, looking at keeping that program through next year so that teacher or so that the teachers can add to it you know four or five times a year so we can really make sure that um, most of our students are represented in that, so that they, they really did a nice job with that. Uh, I wanted to let you know that we have all been attending webinars um, on the COVID relief legislation and funds that are coming down from the federal government, trying to understand exactly how we need to use that money, what we can use it for, um, so I know, I know Victoria has attended some, I've attended some, um, and it's, it's, there's still information coming out from the federal government as well, so, but we will be having more conversation with you about that coming up soon because, um, you know, they're encouraging us to, to get our application slash grants in, um, this summer, so we'll, we'll be getting more information about that, but it is a significant amount of money. Um, and then uh, I also wanted to talk, tell you that um, I'm meeting with each of our indi individual department chairs and grade level coordinators over the next month to really start talking about next year. Uh, I've, I've given them a kind of thought catcher to, to talk with their grade level or their department um, about three different questions. The first is something that came out of our um, staff diversity subcommittee. Uh, one of the things we're talking about is recruitment 
and encouraging people to come to Highland. And so the question for this group is to talk about what makes Highland unique. Why, why should um, people want to come work in Highland, what it is about us uh, that makes it a great place to work. So I've only done a couple of the meetings so far, um, but unanimously, you know, the connections that you have with students and the relationships that you can build has been the number one thing that people have talked about. But, um, but so I'll be giving you more information on that as we move forward. Um, the second question is a reflection question about this year. While we all know that it has been more difficult than years we've had in the past and, and very draining, um, there also are things that we want to keep. What do we want to move forward with next year? What are some things that, that we don't want to disappear? Um, again, only a few so far, but one of them is that use of Zoom to increase communication with the community. So, you know, thinking about, um, we actually got more participation from parents with the Zoom parent-teacher conferences, so how might we capitalize on that next year? Or, um, you know, sometimes our, our big group meetings that we have, is it actually a more efficient use of time to go through Zoom? So, so that's one of the things that's coming out, out among others. And then the last question is, you know, we're, we will continue to be a one-to-one -one district next year for our students. So what are some of the things that we've learned this year that we, again, want to continue using next year, but also what support do teachers need to use these devices to enhance and, um, and support the work that we're doing? You know, it's, we don't really want them just to be used to, um, you know, do a worksheet on a computer and set up by hand, what are some of the capabilities that those devices have? You know, we, we have the ability to um, interact with the world. So how are we going to bring that world into our classrooms? And again, what kind of support do teachers need um, for us to help them with that? So those are the three things. Again, I'm, I'm enjoying the individual conversations because it's a way for me to um, get a better picture from the individual teachers of what's happening in their building and in their, their practice. As, um, as educators, um, instead of trying to do it in a big, our monthly group meeting where not everyone has the opportunity to talk. So uh, so that's what's happening. I, I'm meeting with them, again, um, from now until the beginning of June. And then just an update a little bit more on our district equity committee. I think I mentioned this at one of the last meetings, but the Board of Regents did adopt a commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusivity as a board. Um, so we know that the work that we're already doing is going to be supported at a statewide level. Um, so you know, I'm, I'm proud of the fact that, that we've been working on that already this year. And then Megan mentioned it with her middle school report, um, <clears throat> but the librarian has also been doing an audit of our high school collection to look at it. Um, to make sure that our collection really represents all of our students in our school community. And you know that goes beyond racial diversity, that's also um, uh, inclusivity on, on all, all levels, LGBTQ, feminist, um, religious, on all levels. So uh, it's, it's great, she's, she's created a whole uh, spreadsheet that not only has the title of the book, but then highlights ones that are, you know, represent some subgroup and that gives a little bit of a synopsis of what that looks about. So I think for the next person that will be coming now, you know, that's a good place for them to start to be able to create collections or to highlight collections as we move through the school year, especially hopefully next year when students can actually be in our library. So that's, that's a little overview of what's going on. Any questions for Sarah? Thank you, Mr. Barone. <clears throat> We've heard it several times, but that's okay. It's worth saying again. Wonderland High was amazing. The amount of work put in by everyone, the students, Ms. Bradley, Mr. Schott, it really was incredible. Uh, in addition, as Sarah mentioned, the virtual art show. If you did not get a chance to see, please make sure you take time, it really is amazing. That is definitely something we, I would want to us to continue. Uh, you know, that could just be forever. You know, we could have a, an ongoing virtual art show that for many years to come. 
As far as the support services, I know I put some texts and emails out, but you still haven't nailed the date down. I know it's difficult, but with, you know, uh, Victoria and I met last week with Bernie Donegan uh, via Zoom, and they went through the timeline for a, another project. So we have, uh, you know, about a $12 million project that we would want to do next, and really we would probably the latest want to go to a vote be next December. So it, it comes very fast. So really, we do need to meet. I know it's tough to get everyone there. So I'll just, we don't have to talk about, I'll resend something out tomorrow just saying, hey, uh, this date, and whoever can come, can come. Uh, just so we can keep the, keep the process moving. Because December vote, really we have everything wrapped up in by October for a December vote. December of 2021, yes, okay. As far as current things with uh, support services, so the uh, meeting with Mr. Miller, the library roof material is in, and we are waiting for the installation uh, from the, from the uh, contractor. We also are ordering the furniture as we speak, so all the furniture for the uh, new high school library is being ordered. It's at the business office level, I believe. There was just some final things we had to do with which ones we want power and which ones we need, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we nailed it down and that ordering is going out. I know that there's a lot of talk about uh, the CDC and the lifting of mass restrictions and even tomorrow New York State has some uh, announcements, but really in schools nothing has changed. So New York State schools nothing has changed. I know that um, the county legislators from the surrounding counties are setting up a meeting with the governor just to talk about uh, the mask laws, but as of now Everything is still on school grounds, in schools, you still to wear a mask, and there's still, we don't have firm updated news as far as graduation ceremonies. So at the moment, we're still planning on two ceremonies. As far as sports, uh, spring sports are all, thankfully, the rain stopped, <laughs> and uh, all the sports are going very well. We've had to, we've had very few cancellations or rescheduling of sports. Uh, it ends pretty quickly, really. That week after um, Memorial Day is sectionals, and everything will be done right around June twelfth. And I know I mentioned my week, weekly report, but I, I'm very happy. Senator Hinchy uh, has been very active uh, with schools. So uh, we had a press conference last Wednesday at Kingston High School. Uh, Mrs. McLaren and I attended that with the superintendent of Kingston and New Paltz. Uh, she was uh, very open to helping schools, uh, gave us all our personal contact information, and then she is you know, going to be meeting with our students about that mental health day. So thanks again to Senator Hinchy for all her work and to our old friend Mike Martucci. So uh, Kathy and I go way back with Senator Martucci. That's all I have. Just a quick question. Um, on the library roof, what contractor is installing that? Darwin. So is that the same contractor that installed it the first time? Correct. And there's proper controls in place to make sure we don't enter into the same issue? Yeah. From my understanding, there's supposed to be 100% supervision. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for the superintendent? Okay, we'll move on to um, new business and the Board of Education. Uh, we have our reorg meeting. Right now, scheduled for July 1st at 5.30. Um, it's an important meeting to, to kind of uh, kick the uh, restart of the district uh, off as far as the reorg. Uh, does anyone have any issues with that July 1 date? Are we all currently available for July 1 at 5.30? I know Marlboro has their 
we were meeting also on July 1st, but I thought I saw time to start time of 7 p.m., so that that might work. Um, anybody, everybody okay with that? July 1? Okay. July 1 at 5.30. Our second reading of uh, our policies, our 7,000 policies from 7610 through 7690, I won't read every one of them. Uh, everyone had an opportunity to review all the policies and ready to move forward for a resolution for our second reading and the adoption of those policies. Good. Okay, be resolved, the Board of Education final recommendation. Ellen, I'm sorry. Uh, I just, I had that one question about the plan. I, yeah, Mr. Boyd. Yeah, I had a similar question. Can you hear me? No, why don't you go to the mic, no, Mr. Boyd. Thank you. So all the information that they outline in the district plan is information that we have, but we haven't compiled it into one document, so we'll be doing that this summer. So in, in some of the stuff included, it's you know, having a budget, which we always have a budget for special education. Uh, some of the things outline uh, the Board of Education making sure we have spaces for special education programs, which we of course do, um, but, and we have some of the information about program descriptions, they just haven't been compiled into one specific document together, but that will be happening. So when will we see that? Probably at the beginning of the school year? Is that when you would um, envision kind Probably of like this summer. I mean, okay. typically for that, um, the summer is a good time to update some of that stuff because it's not happening during the school year. So this summer. Okay. Thank you. Do you want to hold that? Well, we're adopting a policy that states we have a plan, but we don't have a plan yet. One of those, uh, one of the policies mentions, but I just don't recall. 7610. Yeah, 7610. So we can pull 7610 and do the second reading, uh, you know, in August or September, once we have the plan in place. That's fine. Okay, so we'll, we'll oh, yeah, we'll, no, that's that's we'll right. We'll take we'll we'll before the horse Anyone else have any questions regarding the other policies? Okay, I read a resolution. I have uh, a motion. A motion by Hendrick. Second. 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 We already had discussion. So we're going to hold uh, policy 7610 district plan. So that is the written, and then we'll adopt that district policy. Okay, any other discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? So carried. Okay, Educational Consultant Independent Contractor Agreement. Be it resolved, the Board of Edu Education, upon the recommendation of the superintendent, hereby approves a signed agreement between the Highland Central School District and Learning Insights with their principal place of business located at 3548 Route 9W, Highland, New York, as presented to the board at this meeting. Can I have a motion, please? Motion by Tom, second by Heather. Discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? So carried. Okay, uh, under old business, everybody knows today is the annual budget vote and board member election. We have the uh, two propositions also. If you haven't voted yet, you still have 20 minutes, so you can walk right next door and, and vote those that are eligible. Anything for the good welfare of the district. I'll open the meeting up to public comment. I'll close public comment. We do not have to go back into executive session, so I'll ask for a motion to adjourn. Motion by Heather, second by Tom. All in favor? Opposed? So carried. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night, and we'll see you next door.